Good evening and welcome. Sam is taking the week off. Maybe it's because we're a nation of adventurers that we harbor this constant fascination with people who dare to break the rules. Even at Christmas, as the movie box office makes clear, the gangsters, like those in Godfather 3, are the ones packing them in. But you might want to know that, for the most part, art is no longer imitating life. Off-screen, this past decade has been a pretty ragged one for the mob. Out of 25 crime families who preside over the underworld of this country, the FBI has convicted 20 bosses and 15 underbosses on charges that range from racketeering to extortion to murder. And yet, through it all, one name has retained the old romantic notoriety. The man said to be the boss of the powerful Gambino family. His name is John Gotti. Three times police have brought charges against Gotti, and three times he has beaten the rap. He's in jail tonight because police arrested him on December 11th. They're going to try again. What follows is a portrait of the man said to be the real godfather. It's based on our conversations with police, FBI, and Justice Department sources. Law enforcement officials who insist that sooner or later, they're going to get the man who's been called the Teflon Don. He's certainly not a Robin Hood. He is a common thug. He's no better than, the, than your local crack dealer. He's just an out and out violent swine. People love him. They stop me on every street corner to wish him luck. You wouldn't believe it. Is he a mafia boss? Absolutely not. And, and the jury has said no three times. Does he run an organized crime syndicate? Absolutely not. Jury has said no three times. How does he make money? I won't discuss with you what he does. But police say they know what he does, and that's why they arrested him three weeks ago. The charges? Four murders and plotting a fifth. Extortion, loan sharking, racketeering, bribing witnesses, tax evasion. But Gotti faced his fourth arrest in five years with customary nerve. He mouthed a message to reporters. No problem. So who needs to go to the movies when you can watch a real star at work? Police say the true mystery and menace of the modern mob can be seen right here. Move the camera in and take a closer look at his face. This son of dirt poor Italian immigrants. Police say a smart kid who dropped out of school to set up his own bookmaking operation and start a 30 year climb that would make him prince of the streets in designer clothes. They don't like the fact that uh, he walks with his head high, that he doesn't hide and pretend to be something other than what he is, which is John Gotti. Gotti's attorney, Bruce Cutler, he says the prosecutors have a kind of personal vendetta. He's got tremendous integrity and loyalty, and this sticks in the craw of law enforcement people who justify their existence by making these big so-called mafiosa cases. From past performance, you know, he is a thug, he is a, he is a killer, he's a hijacker. Jerry Capisi, newspaper man and ABC consultant, has covered John Gotti for a decade. He became a gangster early on. You know, he was a street hood. He was a, uh, in the street gangs when he was a teenager. He, he burst on the scene in, in December of 1985 with the killing of Paul Castellano. Paul Castellano, in 1985, the head of the Gambino family. Could be a limit, you know, take it easy. Who knew only that he had an ambitious young lieutenant waiting in the wings. Gotti had worked his way up through hijacking the goods off of trucks and gambling operations in Queens. He was a money maker because of his cleverness. Uh, he was able to make money for the family. We're basically your only salvation. Ed McDonald, who portrays himself in the film Goodfellas, was in charge of federal anti-organized crime efforts in the New York area until 1989. But very important, uh, John Gotti uh, was a charming fellow. He was somebody who uh, uh, was respected uh, and uh, admired by the people uh, in the family. But investigators say he was also impatient, if not for power, for money. Some of his deputies, even his brother, sold heroin breaking the Gambino family rule, no dealing in drugs. A rule not because of morality, it's just that drug sentences bring long prison terms, and long prison terms create snitches. So one way or the other, Gotti and Castellano were on a collision course. It was basically a, um, a dispute over drugs uh, between, uh, within the Gambino crime family, which escalated into a kill or be killed situation. 
a meeting was scheduled between Paul Castellano, Tommy Bellotti, John Gotti, and three other Gambino mobsters. Tommy Bellotti was Castellano's driver that night, but more important, the heir to the Castellano empire. It was December 16th, 1985. Castellano arrived at Spark Steakhouse at about 5 p.m. to have dinner and conduct a little mob business. It was the height of the Christmas rush here in Midtown Manhattan. Three gunmen were lying in ambush, and as passers-by stopped and watched in horror, Castellano and Bellotti were shot repeatedly. Then the gunmen calmly, brazenly walked a block, climbed into a Lincoln, and disappeared in the Midtown traffic. But prosecutors now say they know that someone else was nearby, John Gotti. And that this man, Phil Leonetti, a Philadelphia mobster, is going to testify that he heard Gotti brag about murdering Castellano. There's certainly no smoking gun in this case, Diane, because Mr. Gotti doesn't commit crimes. Does he plot to commit murder? Of course not. And he's been acquitted of things just like that. So it was just a... Well, somebody killed him, Diane. We know that. But the prosecutor would say, who stood to benefit? Who did benefit? Well, they claim that uh, all the time. But, you know, Diane, that's not evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. That's not the, the kind of uh, level of proof we need in courtrooms. Uh, uh, that's not the kind of thing that uh, is supposed to take somebody's liberty away. And that was the end of Paul Castellano and the beginning of John Gotti's uh, reign as boss of the Gambino crime family. Eight days later, on Christmas Eve, um, more than 200 uh, wise guys and would-be wise guys showed up to pay homage to John Gotti at the Ravenite Social Club, which he took over uh, as his own Manhattan base of operations. A new era had begun, and what an era it would be, not since Al Capone had anybody so stirred up the public appetite for a larger-than-life lawbreaker. Gotti even seemed to make himself over for the part. Razor-cut hair and $2,000 suits. A kind of renegade gentleman. Totally self-educated. A vocabulary second to none. Uh, he is he reads, a unique... He... Constantly. What kind of thing? Everything you can imagine. I would think he has the IQ of a mortal. Joe Coffey, special investigator for the New York State Organized Crime Task Force, is confounded by the Gotti myth. You're dealing with people who operate strictly by intimidation. That doesn't take many brains. I think people uh, like and respect the fact that he stands alone. But not exactly alone, if you believe the police. They say the Gambino family has 400 initiated men, 4,000 associates, and an estimated worth of $500 million leached off the economies of big cities from California to New York. Here's a map of what police say is the Gambino city within the city. Start with the streets. They can dictate where and when garbage trucks make their rounds. Which trucks carry which goods? And in the garment district, they pretty much control which supplies get where and when. And if you're going to build a building, they have so many tentacles in the unions, they'll influence everything. Which plumbers your contractor hires? The price of concrete? which is, by the way, twice as expensive in New York, police say, because of the mob. And police say they even got a $2 kickback on every window in public housing here. Now, surround all of this with a swirl of criminal activity, gambling, loan sharking, hijacking trucks coming into the city, prostitution, and drugs. You name it. In fact, his own brother is currently doing 50 years for selling heroin. Joe Coffey doesn't appreciate and realize that John Gotti is deadly against drugs. And Joe Coffey doesn't want to realize that in any neighborhood John Gotti spent any time in, uh, there were junkies and drug dealers. And as soon as he got there, they were gone. So, uh, so you say Americans would be lucky to have a Gotti in every neighborhood? No question about that. You could leave your door open, your window open. You could take your roof off in the summer. Believe me when I tell you, Diane, not even a question. Mr. Gotti's neighborhood, Queens, a kind of legend in New York, where he throws huge 4th of July parties, and his neighbors defend and cheer him on. Gotti's the best! Gotti's the best! Even though they must remember what happened 10 years ago. A neighbor in a car struck and killed Gotti's 12-year-old son, Frank. Four months later, the neighbor disappeared. Gotti lives in this house with the woman he's been married to for 30 years, Victoria Gotti, also a legend. She's been quoted saying, I don't ask what he does, he provides. 
And don't expect Gotti to skulk about the streets any day of the week. You can see him late in the morning, heading off to his day at the office. You guys in Giuliani should be in church. Climbing inside a big sedan driven by a bodyguard. By the way, the tough guy is reportedly afraid of flying. Along the way, he may stop to place a ten or $20,000 bet on a sports event. He's a big gambler, some say a compulsive gambler. And eventually, he'll settle in at the Ravenite Club in Little Italy, a kind of boardroom where he plays cards and presides like a feudal lord. Police say one of the first things he did when he took over the family was give the vassals a larger share of the take, sometimes five times as much. Gotti has made his, his mobsters much more content with the amount of money they've been getting from their rackets. But the hand that gives out money can also turn into an iron fist. In a previous trial, police played a tape of Gotti, which they say is the real voice of a real godfather. The man on the other end of the line hadn't returned Gotti's phone call. Listen, I called your in the house five times yesterday. Now, if your wife thinks you're a husky or she's a f***ing husky, and you're going to disregard my mother phone calls, I'll blow you in the house up. I never disregard anything you want. you call your wife up when you tell us. This is not a game. I don't have to reach for you for three days and nights here. My time is valuable. What that is, is two old friends, one yelling at the other, losing his temper, which he does all the time. And now John Gotti is in jail again. And prosecutors say they have new and better tapes and more witnesses than ever before. Though everybody knows the record is on Gotti's side. This is our fourth case in five years. Uh, I'm confident we'll be vindicated when we go to trial. The stakes are very high. This is the case. The government has to win this case. But there has to be one image lurking in the back of every prosecutor's mind. You find him not guilty. After the last trial, when the alleged real-life godfather came out of the courtroom a free man, he turned and gave a salute to the cheering crowd. A salute that seemed to say, I'm back. You might want to know that early in his career, Gotti did spend some time in jail, including one time for manslaughter, but he managed to get out after only two years because of good behavior. The trial for these current charges is expected early next year. And one minor footnote, yes, we did ask if Mr. Gotti liked the Godfather movies and Goodfellas. We were told, quote, he doesn't go to see any of those things. We'll be back.